Hello, and welcome to Born to Shop, which still has a question mark on it, luckily. Um, shopping has, however, become our culture's sort of raison d'etre in a lot of ways. And in this discussion, we're going to explore the fundamental issues that exist around our current consumer mindset and try and find out what we can and can't change about the human psychology that is really working around this issue. So it's a privilege to have here with us the journalist and screenwriter Maya Singer, who is particularly known for her reporting on the fashion supply chain for US Vogue, and two brilliant activists, Arizona Muse and Wilson Oriyama. Um, Arizona is particularly known for advocating sustainable materials, and Wilson is an anti-consumerist activist. Both also happen to be top models, <laughs> we may have seen before. And we're lucky to have such a great panel here because um, this evening's issue is incredibly urgent, as we all know, but just to really uh, highlight this with some recent statistics, Earlier this month, the Boston Consulting Group and Sustainable Apparel Coalition released their annual assessment of the fashion industry's environmental and social performance. In their findings, they state categorically that the pace of positive change does not match the projection growth of the fashion industry. Projections suggest that by 2030, the global apparel and footwear industry will have grown by 81% to 102 million tons, exerting an unprecedented strain on uh, planetary resources. So if the industry's pulse score remains on its current trajectory, the gap between industry output and pulse score will continue to widen, and the harmful consequences of increased production are going to become even more challenging to overcome. So let's start with a general question here that I want to ask of all of you guys. Are we in a situation here where our industry's dominating business models um, aren't even compatible with sustainability? Are sustainability and fast fashion mutually exclusive, for example? Um, all right, I'll go for that one. Um, I would argue that they are. Um, I do not believe that ultimately like you can have a business model which is based on constant replenishment of a wide variety of product made quickly and as cheaply as possible in order to be sold for very like thin margins. That I don't see a world in which like that can ever be um, ecologically sound or good for you know the people who are actually like making the clothes. Um, do I believe that fast fashion in particular is uh, uniquely bad as like a player in the industry right now? No. Do I think it's going anywhere? No. So, you know, are there ways that we can incrementally make it more sustainable and more ethical? Ideally, but um, I think that everything in the business model um, fights against that. Would you agree with that, Wilson? Yeah, I definitely agree, partly. I think um, what brought us to today with regards to how we consume or like the, the way the supply chains are set up today has done us a lot of help, but of course it's put us in a lot of problems. So, sorry, however, it won't necessarily bring us to tomorrow, so I do think there's a, a need for a redesign in the way that the whole system is and how businesses develop uh, or produce clothes and then sell it onto the consumer and then after use and all of those stuff. Right, and Arizona, do you think that this is also about like inciting government to make changes or the individual shopper or is it about boycotting, you know? I think it's definitely about, definitely about legislation coming in and governments taking a much bigger role in this and yeah. quite quickly and urgently and in fashion, but the wonderful thing about fashion is that it creeps into so many other industries as well. So when you begin to put legislation on fashion, suddenly you're looking from a materials point of view at yeah. a load of different industries that then begin to get regulated in a way that they just weren't before. 
Maya, in a recent piece uh, for U.S. Vogue, you said that you'd given up on the concept of ethical consumerism and the belief that we can shop our way to progress. Can you talk us through your loss of faith in this concept? Um, yeah, I suspect that that is not a popular opinion at this particular conference. Um, That's but I think that for me, you know, I just felt like there was something very constricting about the idea that the only way that we have political power um, in our society is basically through the exercise of our consumer choice. And meanwhile, looking around at what was actually in the marketplace, what people have to choose from, it just felt like there was really nothing that I could shop for that would represent you know, even a majority of kind of my ideals as a citizen. And thinking about the ways that people actually shop and like the, you know, their primary values being like function, cost, um, convenience, it's, you know, health, if it's food, et cetera, et cetera. That ultimately like time and time again, like just making a decision at the point of purchase, like those are always going to be prioritized over abstract concerns, no matter how passionately held. And it's exhausting for individual consumers to be put on the hook every time they're making a purchase, whether it's like soap or it's a sweater or it's a car or it's a piece of furniture. And meanwhile, I just feel like it's also an incredibly disingenuous argument on coming from the corporation side. Because, you know, th there was a panel earlier today talking about wages and the issues of, like, uh, low wages in the garment sector. And one of the women on the panel frankly acknowledged in a way that I found refreshing that there is no mainstream brand that is producing in what I would consider an ethical fashion vis-a-vis, -vis, like, wages which means that basically there is no option in the mainstream marketplace for somebody who wishes to prioritize that concern. So how can you vote for that concern within the marketplace? You cannot. The only answer is to stop shopping, which I guarantee you is not the business model of any brand that is involved with being a brand. Um, but that would be the only honest way to sort of explain the position to the consumers. Like you can either have clothes or not. One thing I think that is important to think about as well is that the whole idea of advertising and marketing really needs to change. It is so unfair and it makes me really frustrated and angry when I think about it from a child's point of view. There are highly paid, highly educated adults who are trying, it's their job to trick children into wanting things that they don't need and that are possibly not even good for them. And this happens with adults as well. I think advertising really needs to, we need to have an education embedded into advertising that is strong on ethics. And that happened in medicine, but it hasn't really happened in, in advertising yet, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> or maybe it's even, maybe there's a way of regulating av uh, advertising. I mean, I know that we were all talking the other day about uh, there was a big fast fashion brand mm. that actually printed physical labels that they put on their clothes that said, I can't wear this again because I've already posted it on Instagram. Like that very concept mm -hmm. and the fact that it's allowed to be perpetuated and encouraged yeah. by huge brands is yeah. terrifying. And is there a way of controlling that? Like, but then you get into the freedom com conversation and a lot of people feel like that's, a, that's your right is to course. advertise and we can't be stopped from that. But if the education were coming in at the beginning of those yeah. people's careers when they're learning how to advertise, if ethics is a strong, strongly emphasized, they would make different choices about how they advertise and they would advise their brands differently, I would hope. Yeah. Wilson, um, in a recent interview with The Guardian, you were talking about uh, your dual career as both activist and model and you called yourself a walking contradiction. And I thought that that was a really interesting concept because it sort of seemed to me that almost the very idea of being both a model and an anti-consumption activist, th those are conflicting concepts. But how do you square this dilemma? Because I think a lot of us in the industry would feel like 
we're engaged, but we're faced with this conflict as well. And also, do you have like a set of guidelines that people can follow in terms of what brands you would and would not work with? Um, sorry, I just want to jump back to the yeah, previous yeah, sure. point around uh, regulation. I think that I, I agree with Arizona in that governments do need to get involved a lot more. But of course, there's a general, not just in fashion, across all industries, of course, there's a general fear because the role of governments is to support free markets and help like um, brands and business, businesses to get a foot into the market and start producing profit. But it's, it's a tricky uh, conundrum when it's like you've opened a door and say 20 years ago, you've, you've maybe only set like one or two guidelines that say a business has to do in order to be able to exist in the space. And then you've like added more stipulations year after year but at the same time, you've got uh, new entrants which have to follow with, say, who have to enter with a particular set of rules. However, you haven't really said anything to the brands that came in or the organizations which came in all the way back when. So I think right. that governments actually need to feel more comfortable around actually uh, not killing, but essentially heavy fines for just, just poor practices. And, and just willful ignorance in, in certain cases. But to jump back, in terms of uh, walking contradiction, um, I think humans are naturally contradictory beings. Like, we all, we may t like I may tell you some advice that I would go and do the exact opposite in the, in the same day. Like, you could tell a child, oh, don't go there, and you may go there or, or eat something or, or anything. And I feel like it's, it's just how we have to um, we just naturally exist because if we were completely straight down the line, it, it wouldn't work. And, and we're very contextual as well. So I think it's, it's just more about like judging each situation as you come across it and then determining, does this work for me? Does it not? And, and just weighing up the opinions. And then, sorry, the last part mm -hmm. was... Oh, I was wondering if you sort of had a set of guidelines of your own pers guidelines of your own personal values in terms of how you like decide on a brand. Like, if someone approaches you, they say we want to work with you, or maybe okay. these kinds of brands don't because they know that you're going to turn them down. No, so there's always tricky because regardless whether you, if you've got a presence on say Instagram or Twitter or whatever, brands or people will just come to you asking you to do things for them. So it's like, oh, could you post this? Could you write this? Could you yeah. do a feature? Could you wear this or something? But I think there's different metrics that I do every time. So is it sustainable enough? Or, or, and then, sorry, sustainability is so vague because each brand has um, their own particular to approach to sustainability, of course. Then it's also like, how do they communicate with their audience? what does it actually visually work for me? Like, can I really associate? Because you have to think of yourself as a brand and all of these other different things. So there's quite a few different mm -hmm. metrics that change based on the brand. So, I mean, I feel like, can I just, yeah, yeah. I mean, so I think that like that approach is, and this is where I have like my conflict about like the ethical consumerism piece as well, because I think, you know, as an individual, yes, like it is always important and meaningful to like think through these choices in your own terms. But in terms of like taking that to scale, I just don't think that like you can aggregate so many individual choices. And that's where like the, the policy piece has to come in. You know, it's like for me, I think that there's, it's very hard to sort of rally c consumers to make a series of choices that are going to wind up, for example, uh, forcing brands to fully pay for the environmental costs of packaging, as an example. You know, if you see just like all of the plastic wrap that garments come in when they come into stores, all the hangers, and like just those are costs. And if they're not being borne by the, the brands that are profiting off the product, then they're being borne by the taxpayers in the places where those brands operate. Places which I might add, many of those brands aren't paying any taxes because they do transfer pricing and, you know, have all these ways of like basically getting out of putting any tax bill. So it's like, you know, there are so many pieces to this, but it all to me comes down to like fashion has been massively underregulated for basically its entire history. And it is getting away with like basically not paying its costs. And in, that is part of what it allow, what allows 
fast fashion brands to sell as cheaply as they do. So. So what would that kind of regulation, an example, you're, you're American, what would that kind of regulation look like and how do we as individuals go about putting pressure on our governments to, to, to implement that? I mean, sorry. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that, I don't know if I even have the answer to that. I mean, I think that the, the hardest problem in the world right now is basically figuring out how to capture people's attention and get it to stick. We live in the age of the feed where, you know, one second you see like a hashtag about, I don't know, like put a tariff on plastic. And then the next thing there's like, hey, like Kim Kardashian. And, you know, it's like mine somewhere else. Um, and I think getting, figuring out how to in getting people to engage politically when all they've been trained to do for the last 30 years basically is to act politically through consuming is a huge change in the discourse. Right. Mm -hmm. And Arizona, you've actually argued that a lot of the way that we can make progress quickly is through materials and that's kind of your area of expertise. So how do you, because I know that you educate brands about mm -hmm. how they can make the right choices. Mm -hmm. um, you know, where, where do they start? Well, if I'm a young designer, yeah. what are your like three top tips? First, I think it's important, let's make a distinction between a, what you can do as a brand and what you can do as a consumer, because yeah. as a consumer, you have purchasing power, which is really important. It does make a difference. If you choose not to buy something, it eventually, trickle, the effect trickles on, as we know, and something will not be made. Next round, things are ordered if many people didn't buy them. So you do have a, you have a power as a consumer, but as a brand, you have an even bigger power because you're ordering from the supply chain that made those things. So your, your choices are even grander and have even grander consequences or positive benefits. As a new or established designer, any designer should be choosing much higher quality fabrics and you should be looking into where they came from. Are they natural? But not only are they natural, natural isn't good enough because as we know, agriculture is one of the most destructive industries in the world. And so we can't, that, that's not an excuse anymore, but we all know that in this room. Choosing organic, choosing non-synthetic fibers, choosing recycled, it makes a huge difference also to the companies that you're buying from. Think about them, a lot of, the, a lot of where the st startups and innovations, they're quite new and they really do need the support of brands. So as a brand, if you, ch if you change suppliers, that will have a huge role on impact. Right, and so as individual consumers, like what are the, how do we look out for greenwashing in our everyday kind of lives? Read the label. Yeah. <laughs> read, just read the just label. Just read the label like you would with food and do a little research. It's not, it, it's not a huge amount of work then if you're shopping anyway. Look at the label, Google that material and just learn a little bit about it and you'll find quite quickly how damaging it is and Make, make the choices. Obviously, organic is always a lot better. And I think, like, I mean, just to be optimistic for a moment, a little bit, I mean, I did wander through, like, the innovation lab here, and, you know, you can see that there's a lot of progress being made on transparency through the supply chain and giving um, information to consumers. Um, that is the product of years of sort of the emphasis, I think, within the sustainability movement being about transparency. So that's great. Now it's time to move on to the next thing. And, you know, I, I believe that the next thing is policy because it's the only thing that I think is truly going to be disruptive to the business models. And, you know, I. Monica, I've said this to you before, which is, you know, if you look, it's very hard to get p consumers to make no choice instead of a choice. Mm -hmm. the, the question is, like, how do you get them to make a different choice? You know, as an example of, like, when consumers switched from, like, buying CDs to, like, streaming music on Spotify. Mm -hmm. You know, that wasn't about giving up music. That was about making mm -hmm. a different choice that happened to be more sustainable. So, you know, unfortunately, you can't put fashion on the cloud so what are we going to do to try to like create a better you know universe of this industry mm -hmm. like what is going to be the disruptive thing the next well what um, sorry. create more accountability essentially because i completely agree and i feel like there is this push to transparency where it's like okay we're looking at what people are doing but how do we actually hold them accountable and i completely agree about policy is like the easiest way to do that and 
what I said about the labels, I think the poli we need a policy change about labels because right now you can't get enough information when you do look at the label because the label will tell you what it's made of. It won't tell you where it was made. It won't tell you what the processing was on the fabric. It won't tell you what the dye was. It won't tell you anything about the profit margin that the brand or supply chain made. It would be nice for us to know, like, where did our money go when you bought this for X amount? Who got that? Right. And that could be on the label. Totally. <laughs> Is the next big disruption also, you know, is it our responsibility as leaders in the fashion industry with, you know, followings um, to create that in a social media sense? Or is that just totally useless and clicktivism? We don't care. What do you think about that, Wilson? Wait, sorry. So do you think that, make, like, having some sort of coalition where, you know, people decide to make a difference through social media, you know, they watch out for each other, like the hashtag idea that Maya was talking about. Do you think that there's any point to doing that or does it have to go higher? Does it have to go up to government and policy? No, I think it has to exist in, in that realm as well as all of the other realms that like you said, because it's like a feedback loop. It's not like things exist in a vacuum. So you have the conversations on social media, they make it into literally every other facet of society which affects policy, which affects the way that companies are run. So I think the conversation online is as important as anything, but it needs to, of course, mm -hmm. extend to other areas. It's not that popular yet, though. I, I've, I yeah, chal have challenges true. with this on my own Instagram account. Mm -hmm. If I post a model no, picture exactly. that's it's like not... sexy or pretty, I get way more likes than if I post one that's about sustainability or me doing something in a sustainable way. Because it's, people it's assume as that you're moralizing, right? So how do we, I mean, I, that's mm -hmm. my interpretation of it and my experience. I don't know why, yeah. And how do we turn it into a positive thing? But it's also the, um, that shouldn't hinder anyone from speaking about it. It's, it's kind of like, if you look at yeah. it and you say, mm -hmm. I do it anyway. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, yeah, just pretty much. Exactly. So. I mean, to me, it strikes me that, like, it, you know, there is power that people who have social media followings and, you know, who are influencers, their power will really come when they start to build coalitions and take mm -hmm. joint action. So, you know, it's like if there's a brand that wants to work with an influencer and they say, you know what, I don't like your business practices and I'm not going to work with you, they're just going to move along to the next person. But like if there's a group of people who are like, exactly. we will not post, yeah. you know, what we will not support and we will come out against you en masse, like that will make a difference in terms of how brands think about the way that their image is getting across. Well, we've got to wrap this up, but I actually think that this is something that perhaps the people sitting on this panel could discuss uh, going forward. I want to thank all of you for being here. Any final words? It's all capitalism's fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah! Well, time is up. Yeah, time is up. Right time time is, up. is up, and so I think this is the last panel, right? So, yeah. Yeah. hopping a virtual yeah. champagne court. So, yeah. have fun, everyone. Cheers. 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 Thank, Thank you. you very much.